Good afternoon, family. Uh, like I said, I was going to be doing the uh, the Romans. Uh, going to try to keep us moving forward this way as we go through this holiday season. We are on track. Uh, when we come back the first of the year, we're not behind at all. Um, That's what we can keep working our way through the book and working our way through growing deeper in Him and growing further uh, in our walk uh, in development and developing the Holy Spirit within us and allowing Him to come out of us, um, understanding who we are as new creation, understanding uh, the new covenant realities that we live in and that we are striving for and that the Father wants us to go into. And so I, I am excited about this. I am excited about the Word. I'm excited about your guys' hunger and your passion to go deeper uh, you know, to get to know the Father, but not just to go deeper in your knowledge, but to go further in your application, living it out day by day, uh, moving forward uh, little by little, and being consistent in that, and just you know, living this thing, not just you know, talking about it, uh, not just uh, having a mental agreement. You know, we've kind of talked about that. There is a difference between mental agreement and actually having faith and walking out in faith. Um, something I was thinking about this morning over the past few days, uh, it comes back still to James where he says, you know, our faith without works is dead being alone. He also says that we're also to be doers of the word and not just hearers only, lest we deceive ourselves. I firmly believe that that deception is that we're okay with the father is that we're living the Christian life just by hearing the word. We're living as Christ lived just by hearing the word, and that's a lie. We're not. We're to be doers. Remember, he said in that day, he will say either well done or depart from you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. What we do, we do by faith. What we do, we do by extension of the Holy Spirit within us. And the Bible says anything outside of faith that we do is sin. So we can just agree with something doesn't mean we're on board with it. Okay, just because you have a mental agreement that it is some, that it is a certain way doesn't mean that's how it's going to roll, right? Doesn't mean that's how it's it's going to work in you. Doesn't mean how it's supposed to work through just because you agree. Because if you don't do anything with it, your agreement honestly is useless. If you don't back up the portion of your agreement by doing then what good is it? See, God in the Old Testament, when he made the covenant with Abram, he walked through it himself. God did the covenant because he didn't want the possibility of Abram to fail his end of the covenant. We have responsibility. We've been given responsibility. That is the kingdom. We've been given the kingdom. Too many people are worried about building a kingdom. Yet we have the kingdom because we have Christ. And again, that's the scripture. Look it up. He said, will he not with Christ also give us the kingdom? It's just good stuff. But with that, let's go ahead and pick back up in Romans. I believe we made it uh, about halfway through. Um, I've tried to go through Romans and I've tried to press on past chapter one. Um, Holy Spirit's not letting me. Uh, until I think there's some more that needs to be brought out. And I pray that as we go through this, he will bring out what he wants brought out, um, that you will receive it. And not only will you receive it, that it will be implanted in you and that you will go out and do it. Um, hopefully you'll understand it and then do it, apply it. That's the quickest way to actually see fruit in your life. Like Pastor Lee was talking about today is by doing. You go out and do the word. Hearing the word is great. Doing the water, doing the word is better. It actually causes it to stick in you and has an impact outside of you. So with that, let's go ahead and pick up. We're going to pick up in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Um, don't just read ahead. Don't just hear it in your head and get ahead of me. Open your Bible. Read it word for word. Then line upon line, let's build this thing, not off of a translation we've heard from somebody. Let's build it on the word. And hopefully we'll make it through the end of 16. There's not very many verses 
or Romans 1, there's there's uh, 16, there's a total of 32 verses. So we're going to try to get through 16 verses out of this chapter. But I'm going to bring some corresponding verses that hopefully will establish this thing in you, through you, out of you, to those around you. But I'm going to pray first, and then we'll keep going. So Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity to witness uh, to our house church and to those that will listen to this message. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And Father, I pray that you bless it through your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, hide me behind your cross. That the words that come forth would be yours and not mine. That it would be your power, your authority, your truth. Holy Spirit, you said you would lead us into all truth. That that is what is heard in and through this message. So, Father, I bless you. I thank you for the opportunity, and I bless these people. Let them be set free. Let them de be delivered right now in Jesus' name. Set free, healed, and blessed as we go through your word, because your word is spirit and it is life. In Jesus' name, amen. So, verse 16, Paul writes, For I... I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, the good news of the kingdom. As Jesus taught, he taught the kingdom. He preached the kingdom. He said, repent, change your ways, change your mind, change the way you're doing how you do life. Because the kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. We can't keep living the old way. Why? Because kingdom has come. Jesus represents the kingdom in its fullness, and now he lives within us. We preach the good news of the kingdom, but not only the good news. What is the good news? It isn't just say a prayer to go to heaven someday. That's great. But being born again, that's the first step. Is accepting Christ as who he is. That he came, he died, he rose again. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father. That the price he paid on the cross was for your sin. That you are a new creation. That your spirit has been reborn, rebirthed. As something that has never been. And it was made back to the perfect image of the Father. The way that was originally intended for it to be. And that it's up to you. You, the individual, yes, you, you, right there, you, to renew your mind according to the word of God, to live this thing out, because as a baby grows, you must grow. As a newborn grows, you have to grow, but you have to grow in the word, you have to grow into the kingdom principles, you have to go into the Bible, yes, you have to read the Bible, not just have somebody read it to you, you have to get in there and read it for yourself. Now let the Holy Spirit lead you into all truth. But the gospel is the good news of the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Well, what does that look like? That's Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead, delivering those that were oppressed of the devil. Jesus going about doing good works. Jesus coming to destroy the works of the devil. This is Jesus ministering and bringing people hope, bringing people life, bringing them freedom that they can live according to the word, that they can be sons of God. No longer servants, no longer slaves, and not even friends, but sons, co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ. Think about that. We're joint heir with Christ. That means everything that he got, we get. As Christ was the the, the perfect representation of us when he went to the cross. He became sin for us. He exchanged what he had so that we could have that and took what we deserved upon himself. Let that settle in. He took what we deserved. He got that. We got what he deserved. His sonship. His freedom is joint authority with Christ because he's in us. And it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. That's the authority. That's the dominion. That's the power. 
Everybody's wanting gifts. I don't want gifts. I appreciate the gifts and I'd like for them to operate accordingly to the Spirit's leading. But I want the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Ghost to work in and through my life, to work in and through your life as a mature believer. Because the gifts will operate regardless. If you're seeking it by faith, the gift will operate. But what does that benefit you? What does that benefit those around you? Because if you're relying on a gift to operate at a particular point of time, why not let it be the gift that's needed in the moment that you can glorify God, set people free, have them experience the kingdom and transform their lives forever? Don't settle. Let's preach the kingdom. Let's do what Jesus did. That's what we're supposed to do. We grow up into all things into Christ. That's growing up. We grow up to be like him. Not like anybody else. Just like Jesus. But the only way we can do that is through his word. And then by doing it. Doing the word. He is the word. We got to do the word. Says the gospel, for it is the power of God. We preach so many things, but is it the power of God? It says the good news is the power of God. Not some psycho babble that comes across as being scripture. If you're a motivational speaker, be a motivational speaker. But don't tell me you're preaching the word of God if it's not the word of God. You're a wolf. You're a liar. Preach the word. It's the power of God for salvation. Healing, deliverance, preserved, made whole. To everyone, everyone who, here's the key, believes. Your belief will dictate your actions. Belief will dictate your actions. Not agreement. Because I can agree that something's right. But when I believe, I'll go along with it and I'll actually participate. Belief and faith, they require action. One, you do by choice. One, you'll do because it's what you truly believe. It, it comes out of you. Your belief will dictate what you say. Your belief will dictate how you act. And you can say that you believe whatever, but if your words are contrary and your deeds are contrary, then you really don't believe what you're saying you believe. What you're saying you believe is what you do. That's really what you believe is what you do, not what you say. You can profess all kinds of things. Your actions will prove different. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And well, guess what? The body follows. Think about it. Think about it. Let's keep going. Who believes? To the Jew first and also to the Greek, the Gentiles. That's us. Okay? Well, before Christ, that would be us. The Gentiles. For in it... The righteousness of God. In what? What do we talk about? The gospel. The kingdom. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Your living is based on faith. If you say that you're righteous and you say that you're in Christ, then you will live by faith, not feeling. Not what you see, not based on your circumstances, not based on the trials and tribulations you may be going through today. Not because somebody cut you off in traffic, not because you didn't get the promotion or, you know, the boss is being a jerk or whatever. You don't live according to those things. We're in this world, not of this world. So what if somebody cuts you off? Let them go. So what if your boss is a jerk? Pray for them. The Bible says, bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. It doesn't say get all mad and angry in a huff and be, you know, whatever towards them. And then you act like a jerk towards them and everybody else. And that's not Christ. That's the world. That's the world system. That's not good news. You're not living good news. You're not living kingdom. That's just reality. Okay. The scriptures are clear. You have an option to live free and to live above all those things, to keep your emotions in check, actually have joy in your life that rubs off on other people. And it blesses them, and it encourages them, and it builds them up. and actually draws them to Christ instead of away from Christ. Because your example of a Christian, if that's you know who you say you are, and you say you believe in Christ, and they're going to think you're a Christian, 
Are you pointing them to Christ or are you pointing them to the world's version of Christ? A carnal version. Not the Christ. Not the true Christ. The reality is if it's not the true Christ, then it's anti-Christ. It is what it is. If it's not Christ, then it's opposite, which means anti. Let that settle in. Hear the word. Antichrist. If it's not Christ-like, then it's world-like. And recall what Jesus said to Peter whenever he corrected him. Told him, get behind me, Satan. For your mind is not on the things of God, but on the things of man. When we try to bring Christ down to our level, we're missing it. Because we're trying to bring it down to a carnal way of doing things and not the spirit. We are spirit, soul, body. The spirit has to lead. Has to. No way around it. But having shame of the gospel, it's fear. I'm not going to proclaim the gospel. I'm not going to declare the kingdom. I'm not equipped to declare the kingdom. I'm going to read some passages here real quick. First one's out of Psalm chapter 40, starting in verse 9. It says, I have told the glad news of deliverance. Deliverance. What is that? Getting you out of bondage in the great congregation. He's told it to all peoples, right? In the assembly. Behold, I have not restrained my lips as you know, O Lord. See, the Lord knows. The psalmist knows whether you've done it. He says, look, I know the Lord knows if I've done it or not. He knows if you've done it or not. Knows if I've done it or not. He says, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. Ain't that a shame? We have the best news on earth. The best hope on earth. The, the, the only thing that's going to bring life, we have it within us. Yet we hide it. Well, I don't hide nothing, Pastor Corey. I, 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 I share. I, I, you know, I, I live for Jesus, and I love Jesus, and I, you know, I do. Do you? When's the last time you shared the good news of the kingdom? When's the last time you've lived the good news of the kingdom for yourself, that others could see your good works and glorify your Father? What good works? What Jesus did? Those are good works. Lee made a good point today. Yeah, you can do good. But it doesn't mean you're doing God. There's many people that do a lot of good works so are still going to end up in hell. And that's a shame. While there are good works, are they God works? Are they Christ works? Are they what he did? Are we doing what he did? The word declares that we are as he is in this world. If we say we love him, then we should walk as he walked. Do as he did. Not just pray a prayer to go to heaven someday. I can't even say that's even true conversion. Because the scriptures also declare that knowing the Father is eternal life. That comes back to abiding. That comes back to dwelling in. And Him dwelling in you. Because whenever all hell breaks loose in your life and hell is what comes out of you. It's a good indication of what kingdom you're a part of. I know that's hard and I know that's kind of heavy. But that's where the rubber meets the road. When you get pressed, what comes out? When you get squeezed, how do you react? Do you react in a carnal mind? In a carnal mindset, the way of the world? Then you need to renew your mind. If you're not actively renewing your mind, you don't have an active hunger for coming to know the Lord, I would say you need to check your salvation. You need to check where you are with the Lord. I can't do that. I, I don't know that. That's between you and Him. But what's your fruit look like? Inspect your own fruit. It's coming off your tree. It says, I have not hidden, verse 10 of Psalm 40, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Now, some of you may not be experiencing that. Well, James talks about it. 
If you have a double mind, Galatians talks about it. You can't be of two minds. You can't say one thing and live something different. That's two minds. You can't pray one way and believe another. At that point, you're wasting your time all the way around. But the Bible says if you're of two minds, you need not expect anything of the Lord. You won't receive. Faith settles it. And then you move forward. But that's what you've got to do. You have to settle it. No one can do that for you. In Mark chapter 8. Let's look at this. Mark chapter 8. Starting in verse 34. says this. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples said to them, If anyone would come after me, are you going after him? Well, here's the stipulation. If you're going to follow Jesus, this is what he says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You have to deny yourself. Denial of your wants, your desires, your, your carnal way of doing things, your flesh way of doing things. You have to deny that. Take up your cross. Die. It's crucifixion. It's death. It's brutal. It's not pleasant. That's why it's called dying. It's not fun. But if you want a resurrection life, you have to die to receive the resurrection. You want resurrection power, you have to die so that resurrection power can work in and through you. You've got to get you out of the way. And the best way to do that is just to kill it. Kill it off. Take on the new nature. Put on the new man. Crucify the old man and his deeds. Verse 35, For whoever would save his life will lose it. You want to do it your way? Then it's done. If you're trying to save your life, you're going to lose it. You're holding on to sand that's just going through your fingers. But whoever loses his life, whoever lets it go, whoever dies, for my sake and the gospels will save it. You want to live, you got to die. That's kingdom. You want to truly live, want to know what life is and have it in abundance, not an abundant life. It's life in abundance, life that you can give out to others, life that you can share with others, life that out, flows out of you into others, virtue that flows out of you, just as it did out of Jesus, virtue, power, life flowed out of him to the woman with the issue of blood. And then many others after that, just by him touching, never said he prayed, they touched him. He laid hands on them. Life flowed out of him. That's life abundant. That's life in the overflow, not abundant life. Again, backwards thinking, backwards theology, doctrines of devils, because it's the wisdom of man and it says it's demonic. And go back to James. That's not me. Go back and look at it. Because that makes it about you and not about others. Life, Christ's life is about others. You living, truly, honestly, it says it's more blessed to give <laughs> than receive. Are you giving your life? For others? Are you giving your time, your treasure, your talent, Billy? Are you honoring the kingdom to get that done? What are you doing? Are you doing the word or are you just a listener only? What does that do? It does you absolutely no good if you're just a listener only. Got to live the word. Verse 36 says, For what does it profit a man? To gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. Soul, not spirit, soul. Okay, if you're born again, your spirit is made new. But you can absolutely lose your soul. Because there's a separation. Because you want to go after it the world's way. The Bible says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. Your total body, the soul. You're supposed to love the Lord with your soul. All of it. Mind, will, and emotions. Love the Lord with all of it. If you do that, you'll have peace. So it goes on. It says, for what can a man give in return for his soul? Don't squander it. What can you give in return for it? Is it worth the price? Is it worth the price for self-gratification? Let's look at it. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes 
and the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If you're ashamed of him, you're not going to do what he says to do. And he's not going to back anything up in your life. But when you go out and act in faith, he'll back that up. He'll prove who he is. When you believe. Mark 16, he said, you know, he, he confirmed the word, confirmed the gospel, confirmed the message with signs following. If you don't have signs following in your life, in your walk, What are you doing? How are you walking? It says, these signs shall follow them that believe. That believe. Okay. Mark 7. I'm just going to go back just a little bit. Actually, no, that comes out of the other passage. Let's go to, uh, let's see, what is it? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we went over this. We talked about this. Having the mind of Christ. But for whatever reason, I think this needs to settle in because I, I don't know that we're getting it 100%. 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 6. 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 6. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. We're not doing this based on man's wisdom. Remember I talked about it. James made that very clear. There's the wisdom of man. Honestly, it's base. It's earthly. It's demonic. The mind of Satan is a carnal mind. Get behind me, Satan, when he's talking to Peter. For your mind is on the things of the flesh, on the things of man. The carnal man is of the devil. So that, that type of wisdom, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is death. It might look good. It might sound good. It might even make sense to the carnal mind. But it doesn't mean it's God. It doesn't mean it's Jesus. It doesn't mean it's life. I want you to have life and life in abundance. I want you to be free. I want you to know him. He wants you to know him. I want you to live him. <sighs> You can't beat it. There's nothing that like it. It says, But we impart a secret and wisdom with the hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. And there's the our glory. All right? None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things, verse 10, God has revealed to us. What things? The things that no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Nor entered the heart of man or the imagination of man. These things. Okay, so Old Testament ideology. They didn't know it. They couldn't see it. They couldn't receive it. Because they didn't have sonship. <laughs> but they looked forward to it. They longed for it. The prophets longed for it. Abraham longed to see the day of Christ. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a man's person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Hmm. The thoughts of God, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God. Which spirit? The spirit of God. We have received it. That we might understand the things freely given us by God. What? We can get it. <laughs> we can grab it. We can hang on to it. It's in us. It's part of us. Come on, that's good. That should make you shout. That should make you jump. That should get you all kind of excited because now we can comprehend the things of God. It's not beyond you. And if you've been using those verses that right there, what I have seen and no ear has heard, the mind of God, the mind of blah, 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 it keeps you in the Old Testament, stop it. <laughs> stop declaring those things. You're not in that covenant. It wasn't intended for you anyway. We're in a new and better covenant. 
The old is gone. The new has come. Live that way. It's free. It's fun. It's exciting. Right? <laughs> and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. If you are born again, you have that spirit. And your spirit within you right now is jumping for joy. Hey, saying, yes, that's it. That's it. Grab it. Go with it. That's what I want. The Holy Spirit is hungry for that. It's in you. Now, that's how you make the interpretation. It's through the spirit. The spirit of truth. The spirit of wisdom. The Holy Spirit. It's good stuff. And there it is. So it ain't just me saying it. Verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. It's a joke. It doesn't make sense. It's not possible. It's excuse after excuse. No, I can't. Blah, 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 blah. Grow up. Quit making, excuse me, quit making excuses and justifications for why you can't walk this thing out. You're without excuse before God. Jesus said, even if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. He also said, even if you've done it not to the least of these, you've done it not to me. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's what he says. It's not me. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. The carnal cannot judge that which is spiritual. They have no way to do it. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Old Testament concept. But we have the mind of Christ. And because we have the mind of Christ, the scripture also clear, we know all things. Everything that Jesus knows, we know. Now, whether we access it, walk in it, whatever, that's not the point. We should be striving for it as we renew our mind, according to Romans 12, and make our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, and proving that which is the good, right, and perfect will of the Father. What is the proof? The proof is what you do. You prove it by doing. You don't prove it by making an argument with somebody. You prove it by living it out. That is what it's about. That's how we do it. Acts chapter 3. I think. No, actually I'm going to skip that one. Acts chapter 14. We'll go there in just a second. But I want you to hear the words. Hear the words. Hear the words of the Lord. Hear what he says. We live this thing out. We make it part of who we are. Hold on to Acts. We're going to get there, but I want to go back to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. It says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit of uh, heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, not covenant. She had no right, no legal standing to come before Christ to seek him for anything by birth. She was a Gentile by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. What was she referring to? What was she asking for? Healing, deliverance. That's what she was asking for, right? And so what does Jesus say? Let the children be fed first. For it's not right to take the children's bread. What is the children's bread? Guess what? Based on the context of this passage, what was mentioned first, the law of first order first, the first mention was healing and deliverance. That's what she was seeking. Jesus says it's not right to take that from the children and give it to dogs. The bread being healing. Deliverance. Salvation. Look at it. Verse 20 says, But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Even those that may be less than, we get something. Even if I'm that low, I still get something. I get leftovers. I get what falls, whatever. I'll take it. She didn't take no for an answer. Jesus told her no. <laughs> That's not good enough. 
This is faith. This is faith in action. She could have taken it and walking away. She already knew she didn't have a right to be there. Jesus told her no, so that right there should have been two strikes. So you know what? I don't deserve it. I'm not in covenant with God. I'm a heathen. I'm a whatever. I don't, whatever. I have, I have no place to do this. And then he tells her no. Oh, well, I guess that's it. Most of us as believers stop when we hear a no. If that no didn't come from God, because every one of God's promises are yes and amen, then you keep on going until you get the promise. Period. You don't stop. You keep going. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. For that statement, what statement? She acted on her faith and proclaimed with boldness. Yeah, that's great, but even the dogs get crumbs, so heal my kid. She stood on faith. She didn't deserve it, had no right to it. She said, but you know what? You can do it, and I, I'm expecting you to do it. And she didn't take no for an answer. And Jesus was like, wow, I can work with that. Stand up and go after it. Don't hold back. Seek the Lord. Go after the Lord. Let's keep on in Romans. We went through this, says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Verse 18, Romans 1, verse 18, Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Remember, you shall know the truth and truth shall make you free. If you refuse the truth, how do you refuse it? How do you suppress it? By unrighteousness. Living, doing, acting contrary to the word of God. It suppresses truth. And because of that, work it backwards, the wrath of God is poured out. This is New Testament. This is New Covenant writing now. He's writing this to the church. Think about it. It says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Even the unbeliever is without excuse because the attributes of God have been manifest in, in the creation itself. Science is backing this up more and more, that being as specific as it is, that when you start getting into you know, statistics and how things are, you know, what is the numbers? What is the probability of these things happening? They start blowing all these ideas and you know concepts and theories out of the water. The probability of certain events happening, the probability of certain by random chance happening, which is most of what the world science says. The word of God is true and every man a liar. It says it's there. For although they knew God, and here's what happens. So they're without excuse. They knew God. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, he's reiterating the same thing again. God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise. So he's saying the men and women here are the same. They gave over because they rejected God and they worshiped creation. They made themselves God. Worshiped themselves, their pleasures, their desires. God said, okay, you want? I'll give it to you. I'll give you over to it. It only gets worse. It only gets worse. Gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for another. Men consuming or committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. I mean, it's bad when you got to get creative to make even greater evil. Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Jesus is compassion. God is love. We are to become love. Okay, that doesn't mean some wispy, woo. 
Love can be firm, yes. It, it can be straightforward. Jesus loved even when he was cleaning out the temple with a whip, turning tables. There was still love. But it was love for the Father, and it was a hatred of unrighteousness. It says, though they know not God's righteous decrees, they decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. The word is very clear. When you practice those things, that whole list I just read, your just desserts, if you will, is death. Believer, are you practicing those things? And don't just say no. Don't be quick. Go back and look through this. Are you practicing these things? The Bible says if you are, you deserve death. It says they not only do them, these people did, but give approval to those who practice them. Are you giving approval to those who practice these things? Are you giving them applause? Are you patting them on the back? Are you saying it's okay? Are you declaring it's okay to do these things? Then you're just as guilty as they are. You're partnering with them. When someone commits a crime, if you're there with them, you are guilty by association. It's just the way it works. That's legality. God is very legal. Yes, he offers grace. Yes, he offers mercy. Yes, all these things are there to those that seek him, those that go after him, those that are purposed for him to live towards him. But those that purposely go after these other things, no, that's not how it works. And see, where I've got stuck here, and I'm about to ready to close this out. I'm doing good. It's where they won't acknowledge God as God. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. When we go after world systems to try to function in Christ, we're denying him. We're denying God. We're going through natural means worldly means to get what God provides instead of trusting him and having faith in him then are we not refusing him as God you know we say he's Jehovah Jireh he's our provider do we trust him to provide or do we stress if we don't get the right paycheck or if we don't you know see the numbers or do we stress do we do we come to a place where you know what you know I gotta do this I gotta do that or are we going to trust God to provide? Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. Do you trust that he's a healer? Your actions will dictate whether you trust him or not to heal. Or that he has healed according to Peter. Peter says by his stripes you were healed, which is past tense. It's a finished work. You were healed. You just need to receive it. And you stand on the promise of God. Whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. I will go by what I know. I will go by truth, not by necessarily the facts. The facts that, oh, I'm in pain still. And the truth says, by your stripes, I am healed. I'm not denying the fact that it's there, but I'm denying it's right to be there. So I'm declaring healing. I'm declaring life. I'm declaring freedom. I'm declaring the word of God. I'm calling those things that are not as though they are. And I'm going to stand on it. I'd rather die in faith than die in unbelief. I'd rather stand on the word of God and knowing according to the word that when I've done all I can do to stand, I stand still, I stand. I'm going to trust the Father. I may stumble, I may fall, I'm not going to make an excuse for it, but I'm going to own my responsibility. I'm going to ask that you own yours. Don't make excuses. Don't make excuses for the flesh. Don't make excuses in your life to not live out the word and to not do the word. Be a doer. Don't walk in deception. Don't deceive yourself thinking that you're walking this thing out as a believer but not actually doing it. Do the word. Don't do what somebody preaches. Do the word. Get in the word. That's why I read so many scriptures. Do the word. Well, guys, I love you. I bless you. I pray that you're encouraged. I pray that you're challenged. I pray that there's a holy conviction that draws you to repentance. And that you want to walk and be more like him. Be blessed.
be free, be healed in Jesus' name. Until next time, I love you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye now.